Way to go, Luke. That was great, wasn't it? Yeah, hey, hey, I'm here to introduce our speaker, but before I introduce our speaker, I have to talk to you about an unbearable situation here in the church. So I want you to get ready, because I don't like to talk about this in front of guests, but we have an unbearable situation. This morning when I got to church, Luke and Tim Bradley and Ronald Madden were out there picking up trash on the parking lot because a bear had been in our trash. <laughs> so that's our unbearable situation. <laughs> you all are going, whoo! You were ready for some good gossip, weren't you? I can tell when you lean in, you kind of go, yes. Hey, God's going to do something great with this guy, Jacob. I had, I had one daughter, and I can remember the battles for the bathroom with one daughter. He's got five. <laughs> you talk about God preparing somebody with patience and kindness. Here's a guy who's married to a wonderful wife, Crystal, and he's got five girls, so six to one. It's a little lopsided, isn't it? But God's going to do something great. I, I, we, Jacob, when he's in, he's been eating breakfast with us at McDonald's, and we just enjoyed uh, visiting with him. And he grew up across town at Covenant Bible Church, has an unbelievable testimony. The Lord is using him in South Korea, and I won't go into any of that. He'll, he'll tell you about that in just a moment. But I just um, watched or saw his recent uh, update, and he was talking to a girl in South Korea, and he found out that she had come from North Korea. She had fled from the North Korea uh, communist regime and come down to South Korea, and he was talking to her. Isn't that fantastic? That's amazing. Isn't it? That is amazing. So, hey, Jacob, you, most of you know him, so we, we're not going to give him a big flowery introduction, but we're just glad he's here. Amen. Let's give him a welcome, all right? Thanks, Jacob. Can, can you hear me? Oh, there we go. So, 안녕하세요. 안녕하세요. No, sorry, that's Japanese. There you go. Well, it is great to be with you here this morning. Just wanted to share a couple things here this morning. I, I do want to share a message with you, but I also want to talk about what, we, what we've been doing. So we've been actually on the mission field for almost six years. So a little bit later, like in two weeks, it'll be six years uh, exactly. And so uh, first, let me show you a picture of our family here. We'll go to the next slide. And if you didn't get to see them already, here they are. Uh, they're somewhere back this way. Um, there they are and, and beyond that too. Um, but we do have five girls. Kira is eight, Aaliyah is seven, Jada is four, Ella is two, and Chris is two. And, and that's not their Korean ages. Uh, we can tell you that later. But uh, I'm, I'm very blessed, outnumbered, but blessed. And uh, I'm, I'm thankful for them. Uh, some of you, we can go to the next slide here, um, may have served in the, the Korean conflict or the Korean War back in the 50s. And uh, if, if any of our Korean staff were here today, they would thank, thank you. Um, and, and I also want to say thank you for your service. Anyone in the military, thank you for your service, for what you do. Freedom is not free, and we could not do what we're doing today apart from what happened back there, the sacrifice that, that people made uh, for the freedom of people in South Korea. Those in the north do not have that same freedom. I'll go to the next slide and show you just a little bit of what Seoul looked like, the capital of Korea looked like in uh, the 50s during the conflict. Just, uh, just a tragedy, uh, what was happening. And go to the next slide here. Uh, this is what Seoul looks like today. It's an incredible, uh, beautiful city, wonderful place. And because of, of what happened then, uh, we're able to be there now. And so thank you for your service, if you served. And just want to show you, sh share with you a couple things that we do there in Korea. Go to the next slide. Uh, actually, first, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Some of the needs in Korea, and we could talk about this uh, for, for quite a while, and we could talk about the needs and things that, that here in the United States we're struggling with. But in Korea, there are a couple of unique things. Uh, one is churches are, uh, generally speaking, struggling reaching young people. Uh, th there's about 20% of the population of Korea that claim to be Christian, and only 3.8% of teens go to church. 
And so they're struggling reaching the next generation. And I think that's a little bit similar to what's going on here. And what we have to understand and what we'll talk to, to people in Korea about is that unless we reach the next generation, there will rise up a generation who does not know the Lord. Just as in the, the days of Joshua, after Joshua passed away and, and the elders of that generation died, there rose up a generation who did not know God. And then we see in the Judges, what, uh, the book of Judges, what happened as a result of that. And uh, we, want to, to, we want to be passionate and focused on reaching those who don't yet know. Because the, the children here and the teens, they are the future of the church. They, they are the church, but they're the future leaders of the church. And so we need to, to pour in to their lives and to love on them. And so I'm so thankful that uh, people like Brother Jeff are so passionate about youth ministry. And that's, that's so important. So I, I'm, I'm thankful for what we do here, and we want to encourage churches there. Uh, in Korea, one of the, the unique things is that just like you could probably say sports here is, is kind of idle, such a huge emphasis on sports. In Korea, there's a huge emphasis on education. Education is everything. And it's the little G God of Korea. And uh, as a result of that, we see, even in our church, there are Christian parents who will send their teen to uh, what we call, what they call a hagwon. It's a, kind of an academy on Sundays instead of going to church. And, and the reason is they don't want to get them to get behind. Competition is so high. And education is not a bad thing. Education is not a bad thing at all. But when that becomes so important that it becomes your purpose of life, then it's a bad thing. Your priorities are all mixed up. And what happens is the, the teens will be so pressured to study, 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 and be the best so that they can get the best grades, they can score the best uh, on that, that exam to enter into the best college so that they can get good jobs and get good money and provide for their family, none of which are bad things. But that pressure is so heavy that when they realize I'm not the best, I, no matter how hard I study, I'm not gonna be good enough. If that was the focus and, and the, the, what they have been seeing as the purpose of their life, then they, they don't have any reason to live anymore. And so as a result of that and other factors as well, uh, right now, Korea, among teenagers, has the highest suicide rate in the world. And the families are struggling. Uh, also, there's uh, a good bit of, of false teaching in the church in Korea. You might have heard of uh, some of the largest churches in the world being in Korea, and that's true. There's a lot of uh, prosperity gospel teaching and a lot of false teaching, a lot of cults, actually a lot of cults that were started in Korea and are spreading around the world. And what we're seeking to do in Korea is very unique, uh, strategically speaking, to reach out not just into Korea, but from Korea into the rest of Asia. And when you hear on the news, even this past week, North Korea launching a missile, I would challenge you and encourage you to pray that God would launch missionaries from South Korea into the rest of the world. And we just wanna be a part of that. And actually, we are a part of that, and you are a part of that as well because of our partnership together in the ministry of the gospel. So what are we seeking to do to, to make a difference there? Uh, let me just go through a little a few of the things in the ministry on the next slide. Uh, this is Word of Life Korea, and uh, we have several different parts of the ministry. We go to the next slide. We have camps. Uh, so, some of the camps we have are all in Korea, and some of them are actually English camps because English is very important. It's part of the education. And so we use that as a tool to draw people in to, sh to minister to them, share the gospel with them. And so this was back in January of this year. I was able to go down to Jeju Island and speak at the English camp there. Uh, go to the next slide. Th through camps, a number, a number of young people come to know Christ, make decisions to, to follow the Lord's will for their lives. And then we have family ministry. Again, families are hurting. And so part of our ministry out there on the mainland of the main peninsula of Korea, is to do workshops and uh, conferences, basically, for, for couples and teaching them about marriage and parenting God's way. And then also, on the next slide, we have a, a family camp that we do right now. We do once a year, to trying to encourage families together in the Word of God. We go to the next slide. We have uh, the Word of Life Bible Institute, which is, if you've heard of the Bible Institute up in Screen Lake, New York, that's actually where I went to school. Uh, right, after, right after high school, I went up there and uh, this, this school here was opened in 2010, and it's all in English, so 
we have students that come from Japan, from Taiwan, of course from Korea, but also from the United States and Canada and other countries around the world. And actually my sister-in-law, my, uh, my wife's younger sister, was there this past year and studied there. And actually, uh, I, have a, I have a guest here as well. Chris, could you stand up? This is Chris Haynes, and he is from Korea, um, and he actually went to the Bible Institute as well, and now he's studying at the Appalachian Bible College over here. So he's just visiting our family for the weekend. You can give him a round of applause. He, he thought I might call him up here and tell him to talk about it, but if you do have questions about what Word of Life Bible Institute in Jeju is like, you can go and talk to him. So Jeju is basically the, the island that, that's south of the main peninsula of Korea, in case you're wondering, and it's a tourism place. It's kind of the Hawaii of Korea. It's very different from Hawaii, but it's the vacation hotspot there. So if you're interested, I think every single person, this is my opinion, but I'm pretty sure it's in the Bible. No, um, I, I think everybody should take at least one year of their life to study, focus study on the Word of God. It's a lifelong pursuit. All of us as believers, we should continue to study the Word of God every day, but at least take one year of your life and focus on it, no matter what you do, whether you're going into the ministry or not, f study the Word. And uh, the, the, the Bible Institute on Jeju includes uh, a trip to Israel as part of the, the tuition there, as well as a trip to, to Thailand to expose students to missions and opportunities around the world to serve the Lord. So go to the Bible Institute. Anyways, next. <laughs> We have, we have local church ministries, again, trying to come alongside of churches to equip them and strengthen them to reach young people. And so this is in our local church in Pyeongtaek, where we live. It's about an hour and a half south of Seoul. That's our hometown there. That's actually Chris's hometown where he grew up and, well, mostly grew up. And then uh, the next slide here, this is a picture of our church where we serve. It's called Pyeongtaek Daegwang Kyohui. And we, uh, Word of Life, uh, and one of the missionaries there partnered with this Korean church to start an English service. So it's kind of a church plant of sorts, a unique church service inside of a Korean church. And basically there are a lot of foreigners in Korea. A lot of foreigners don't know Korean. And so having English service is really helpful. And uh, actually that's how I met Chris. And we met there at our, the church and he wanted to, to, he was interested in studying the Bible and eventually went to the, uh, the Bible Institute after that. Uh, in, in our church, we have an English Bible club, which is connecting the Korean service with the English service and using, again, education to draw people in. And one of the, one of the things about uh, ministering to, to young people is to help develop spiritual disciplines in their lives. If you ask people, uh, generally, there are a lot of teenagers who they grow up and once they graduate high school, then they leave the church. And you say, well, why is that? Or you can say, well, why, why do those who stay, stay? And you can look at the statistics and the surveys of why do those who stay, stay? And a big part of the reason is that they've developed, uh, that they have their own genuine relationship with the Lord. They're, they've developed a, a habit of getting into the word of God on a regular basis and praying on a regular basis, scripture memory, and serving the Lord in the local church, seeing how God can use them, that they're a part of the church. They're not just a different segment over here. They, they are the church. And so, and... I, we want to help students develop those habits in their lives, and so we're partnering with churches to do that, and uh, we, we certainly need your prayer in this area as well. On the next slide, this is the last ministry area that I want to talk to you about. It's called SYME, and it's, it stands for School of Youth Ministries in English. It's basically a school in Pyeongtaek where we live. We teach English to Bi and, and the Bible to college-age students, and we can, I, I want to show you a video here, so if the, the tech team can, can get that ready, we're going to show you a video and just talk through a little bit, talk through a little bit about what SYME is like. Studying English is very hard, studying any language is really hard, actually Korean is harder, I think, but we have, you have to wake up in the morning, especially, you got to get your brain, you know, pumping and your blood pumping so you can think. And in the morning, all the students do a quiet time. They, they read a passage of scripture, the same passage of scripture separately, and then we meet together in a family group to talk about that and to share what they learned and how they're gonna to apply it to their life and pray together. Then we have a Bible study. It's a Bible study class. Then, then we also have some English classes. RAP class there, it stands for Writing, Reading, and Pronunciation. It's just a, it's just a good English class. 
After that, we have chapel every day. And each week we have a discipleship theme. And so that the, the, the theme for that week will be discussed in chapel time and all the students rotate chapel jobs. So one student will be the MC and introduce everybody else and who's gonna lead the song that morning and, and then a different person will help do the skit to introduce the, the topic for the week and what, what we're gonna to focus on. And the students also will, uh, will share their testimony and another student will translate for them. If they're not a Christian yet, which is possible, then they'll share what we call a pre-testimony. And then uh, every week the students memorize a, a scripture memory verse, so they'll help each other memorize that. And then we have, of course, the message time, which is uh, based on, on the same passage of scripture everybody read that morning, and so they're thinking about it and reading and talking about it and then hearing a message on it as well. Of course, you have to eat. How many of you had, have had kimchi before? Do you like it? Okay, somebody does. That's good. <laughs> if you haven't, you need to try it. After after lunch, we have conversation time, which is basically another English class focused on uh, helping the students learn how to talk well. That's a really important skill to have. We do have a lot of fun and exercise time. As you can see, we don't have a lot of students. We have about 20 students right now. and. As you can see, we also through in the classroom part of it, this is small groups where you really are able to build relationships with the students really well. This is our uh, our daughter Car Carissa, and every week we have a uh, family dinner where our family goes out and we hang out with the students, and we'll all ask the students different questions about their lives and and try to get into their lives that way. We also teach the students how to do youth ministry. We're, we're training them to become the future leaders of their church, uh, the leaders of the church, and, and how to minister to young people. So this, this program here, the Bible Club, is what students will put on for other students. And then we'll try to take that out to local churches to minister to them. And they do something similar at the, the Word of Life Bible Institute as well. Okay, we're going to just stop the video there and we can go back to where we were on the other slides just for time's sake. Um, we can go on and, and talk more about that program. But that, I hope that gives you a little idea of what we've been focusing on the last few years. And it, it's a wonderful ministry. And um, if we can go down to the slide where there's a picture of a student who's um, in the water there uh, being baptized. I just want to share, share a little story with you. Um, uh, Mark was a student who came to SYME and grew so much in his relationship with the Lord and he wanted to be baptized and so we, we uh, were able to, to do that and uh, along with a couple of other students as well. Just such a privilege to see students that, that are growing and then wanting to live their lives for the Lord. On the next slide, uh, this is a picture of, of Irene. She came to SYME totally as a non-believer, non non-Christian, but she was interested in studying the Bible and all throughout the whole eight-month program, we counseled her, we loved on her, we prayed for her, we, sh we shared the gospel with her, and we, we taught her, and, and she never, she didn't become a Christian the whole eight months. She graduated from the program, and she could explain the gospel to somebody else, but she had not received it, uh, received Christ. And as she left SYME uh, that summer, later on that summer, I, I got to see her, and with tears in her eyes, she told me how after she left SYME, she realized for the first time that she needed a personal relationship with Christ, and she, she became a Christian, and... Um, just, uh, I could continue to tell you stories of, of how God has changed lives, and you guys are a part of that. And so I just want to say thank you so much for that. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, one of the most common questions we get is, what about North Korea? And just uh, in short, we're doing our best to be prepared uh, for an emergency, in the case of an emergency. And at the same time, we, we believe that God has opened up the doors right now uh, 100% for us to minister there. Uh, we don't know how long that, that will be, but we do feel safe in Korea, and I could tell you more about why, but uh, basically, um, wh when I think about North Korea, instead of thinking about the, the nuclear program and the missiles that they have and, and the threats that they make, uh, I think about these students, and I'm going to show you a picture here next. Um, this is, uh, these are some of the North Korean students that I was able to meet up in Seoul uh, back in July, and they're Koreans, they speak Korean. 
Uh, it's a little bit different, but they're just regular, genuine, authentic people. And um, we had a meal together, and then afterwards, uh, they, they, we got all together, and they, they asked me to share my story with them, what happened to my life and why I'm in, in South Korea. And I'm like, I want to hear your story. What, what about your life, and how did you get to Korea, and what's your life like now? But anyways, I did share with them, and I shared um, that when I was eight years old, uh, my dad shot and killed my mom. And that's when I moved from Massachusetts to Covington, Virginia, just right down the road here. And um, after that happened, usually just like many other people, when you go through a tragedy or something terrible that happens in your life, you question, if God is there and if he's good, why did he, why did he let this happen? Why didn't he stop it? And then I also asked, how, how could, you know, God says to forgive, how could I possibly forgive my dad for hurting me so much? And I couldn't help but, but think, as I'm sharing my story with them, that these North Korean students are asking the same questions. And I can't imagine the things that they've been through. And they're asking, if, if God is there, why is he, one of the students, um, she knows that her parents are in a concentration camp in the North. Why is God letting this happen? What is he doing? If he's good and he's there, what, what's going on? And then how could you even think about forgiving someone like Kim Jong-un and, and his regime and the evil that, and that they're doing and how they're oppressing their people? And especially now that these students are in South Korea, they know the lies that they've been told their whole lives. How could you forgive? And I share with them in my life the, thing that, the, the answer to those questions I found to be the gospel. It's the gospel. Does God understand suffering? Yes, he does. He sent his son to suffer and to take my place on the cross. He died for me. He understands, he, and he's good. I, I may not ever know the reason specifically why that happened in my life, not specifically, but I do know that God is good because of the gospel. I do know that he loves me. I do know that he has a plan, and it's a good plan, and I can trust him because of what he did in the gospel. And then also the other question is, well, how could I possibly forgive? And in the end, I found that that's the wrong question. The question is, because I've been forgiven for so much by, by my sin against a holy and infinite and eternal God, I've been forgiven for all that? Wow, how could I not forgive? I've been forgiven. And then our whole lives, your whole life, if you've been forgiven, it should be all about telling other people about how they can be forgiven too, that God offers forgiveness for them. We, we, we sang some songs this morning about Christmas and the gospel and how, how God sent his son and that's something to sing about, something to celebrate. But sometimes we get so uh, focused on, on our plans and, and we get distracted from the most important things. Um, let me tell you this morning, if you have the gift of eternal life, you cannot keep that gift to yourself. It's, it's, not, it's not only your gift, you, you, you share that gift. And if you have the gift of eternal life, you can no longer live for yourself. You don't, you don't get to say, wow, thank you, I get you know, fire insurance, but now I can go and live how I want to. No, it doesn't work that way. Jesus died for you so that you can no longer live for yourself, but live for him. And so uh, I, I wanna share a, a small devotional with you, really. I, it, it was a message, but I, I, I've uh, talked so long already, I'm gonna shorten it down. But if we go to the next slide here, um, we we'll keep going a couple more slides. Thank you for praying, thank you for giving, and, and thank you for considering how you can go and make a difference as well in Korea, either as a volunteer or as a student. But, but basically, I wanna, I wanna tell you here, um, go to the next slide, show you a, a couple of pictures here. Um, we, have, we had one day the opportunity to go on a hike, and I went with a couple of guys, and you, you can go to the next slide. Um, it's a beautiful, beautiful day, beautiful place up in Seoul. Yeah, There's this mountain in Seoul that we were going up, and that some of the places were, were pretty interesting. You, I don't know if you can see here, but there are ropes along this edge here, and we figured they're there for a reason, and so we kept going, uh, and we, we all made it up, actually, to the top. You can go to the next slide as well. Even the older gentleman with us made it uh, up those ropes, and, and it was a, a beautiful day again, and uh, you go to the next slide. There were some pictures, uh, some, some things around us that reminded us of the brokenness around us, the Buddhist temple here, you can see. A, a, a beautiful city, and 
going up the mountain there, you can look down and you can, you can just see all these apartment complexes all around. And it, this is just part of it, but if you look all the way around, it's just everywhere around you. Go to the next slide. What, what, is, the, what is the purpose of climbing a mountain? To get to the top, right? So, so we can ask the question, what is success? In terms of climbing a mountain, success is getting to the top, right? Well, in terms of life, what is success? The world will tell you, you turn on the television, you look at the commercials, that they'll tell you what your life is supposed to look like. You're supposed to, 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 to do this and do that and wear this and, and have this kind of house and this kind of car and, and have this kind of friends and family and, and all these things. And if you do this and this and this and this and this, then you will be successful. And a lot of that has to do with your education or how, go, how good you look or how well you are in, in terms of athletics and, and, and how much money you have. But when you open up God's word, you see something a little bit different. You see God's definition of success. What, what, is, what is a successful life look like? And, and I ask the question here because in South Korea, again, a lot of the students are, are pursuing, there's this unhealthy emphasis on worldly success. And I think that, that it, it's easy for us to look and, and see like, oh, well that's in Korea and, and look at you know, what they're doing and they're struggling with that, but not consider that Maybe I struggle with that too. And so, if you look at Luke chapter 12 here, just, just for a minute, Luke chapter 12, Jesus has been talking to thousands of people and talking about serious things about life and death and, and uh, eternity. And, and then in the midst of, and he's saying some things, like pretty powerful things, like don't worry what men can do to you. The very worst they can do to you is kill you. Instead, fear the one who can kill you and throw you into hell. And we usually don't talk like that, but Jesus is, is in this, this message where it's very serious stuff. And then it's almost like in the middle of that, there's this man that comes up to him and almost interrupts him. And he makes this, in the context, he makes this absurd request. And so let's, let's read here in Luke 12, verse 13. So someone in the crowd said to him, that's to Jesus, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness, for one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, what shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, you fool. This night your soul will be required of you and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. And as I look at this and think about this, this story, uh, Jesus doesn't address the man's question in the way that he thinks. Um, that the man thinks he should. Jesus doesn't say, okay, you know, this isn't fair in your life, well, all right, brother, give him his money. No. Instead, he addresses a, a problem that is far greater, and it's the problem of, of greed, of covetousness. Th this man thought that, th that that's all he needed, but it wasn't, it was far more. So we'll go to the next slide here, and just wanna focus in on something that I, I would call unsuccessful success. Because we, we all want to be successful in life. But the, the world's kind of success is, in the end, unsuccessful, which is not successful, right? It's, it's a failure. And we need to watch out and don't be deceived into pursuing that kind of success. Because in the end, it's failure. And so what is unsuccessful success? What does it look like? One, it looks delightful. It looks great. In this story, in the parable, there's a rich man. First, he's rich. And then he has a problem. And if the, the problem he has is he has too much. And usually if we, we have a problem, that's the kind of problem we wanna have. Oh, I don't, don't, don't I have too much money. What am I supposed to do with all of it? But it, it looks delightful. It seems satisfying. If I, if I had a, all those things, man, I wish I could be like that rich man. Maybe, maybe some of you have that kind of, of a thought. Uh, but unsuccessful success, it looks good. The next slide. It, it lives, though, for selfish desires. Look at what's missing from what this rich man and, and how Harry responds. He doesn't say, one, wow, thank you, God, for what you've done for me. Thank you for all you've given to me. Wow, what, what would you have me to do with this? No, 
No, he says, look at what I've got. What should I do with it? I'm gonna tear down my barns and build bigger ones because then I will be, finally, I'll be successful and everybody will look at me and wanna be like me. And he also, he doesn't consider what God would have him do. He doesn't consider those around him that, and especially you can imagine in that time and, and culture, the people that would be starving and have, no, have nothing. And so he doesn't say, well, you know, I have this extra food and they need food and let's just put that together. No, I'm gonna store it for myself. And so it, it, he lived for selfish desires and, and look at what happens in the end. Unsuccessful success in the end leads to death. God says, you fool. All these things that you were pursuing, all those things that you thought were what you needed, you didn't need. Look at, look at verse 15. This is, what Jesus, this is why Jesus warns them. Watch out. Why? Because it leads to death. Take care. Be on your guard against all covetousness. He doesn't say money's bad, but watch out for covetousness. One's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. The next slide Verse 21, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So if, if unsuccessful success looks good, but it, le- it, it lives for self and then it leads to death, what is true success then? Treasure for God versus treasure for self. What does it mean to be rich toward God? That's what true success is. Well, first, th- think with me here. If you do not know God, you cannot be rich toward God. That's what true success is, being rich toward God. If you don't know him, you cannot do that. Eternal life is only possible through knowing God. Look at what Paul says in, in Philippians 3.8. I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I had all these things, but all that is, is rubbish to me. All I need is knowing is Christ. The next slide uh, Jesus says in in John 17, three, he's praying, he says, and this is eternal life, what is it? That they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Apart from Jesus Christ, you cannot know, you you cannot have eternal life. You have to know him. And, And think with me here, if you do not prepare for the next life, you cannot be successful. There's no way to do it. If you're not prepared for eternity, no matter what you do on this earth, no matter how successful you are, you're unsuccessful. And then, what, what else? You live for him. Just like the verse that, that I was sharing earlier, 2 Corinthians 5.15, and he died for all, that's Christ, so that those who live, that's us, might no longer live for themselves, but for him who di- for their sake died and was raised again. So live for him. Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. And then, then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. So so what does success look like? You know Christ. You, You know that when you die, you will be with him forever. You can't be rich toward God unless you know him. And then you live for him. You live for him so that others can know him. And it, uh, wh- why is that? Wh- why do we live for him? Well, we, we know that because, like in, in Joshua 1.8, you get to know what God wants really well, and then you do it. It's not very hard. It's very simple, actually. Get into the word of God, find out what God wants you to do, and do it. That's, that's what success looks like to God. You wanna be rich toward God, live your life for him. And I could share with you um, I think of stories like Adoniram Judson who left everything back in the 1800s, left everything and went to Burma, a place where people were not friendly to, to religion. And he, he was tortured and he was imprisoned. And as he saw his, his wife die and his daughter die and his second wife die. And, and many of his children pass away on the mission field and he suffered and he died at the age of 61 and we say, well, look at people like him, and we say, oh, man, look, look at, he just kind of wasted his life. I mean, it's like, we feel sorry for people like that, maybe. But he, he knew what he was doing. He didn't regret it. And so when I, when I think about what a successful life looks like, it's one that's passionate, lived for God. And so I would challenge you this morning. Do, do you know him? Do you know Christ? And are you living for him? 
Are you really successful? And I don't mean how much money's in your bank account. Are you really successful in God's eyes? Let's pray. Father, I pray that we would not be like the rich fool. Help us to consider what it would be in your eyes to be successful and to do it. And I pray here that if you're leading anyone to, to make a decision for you, Lord, that they would, you, you would open up their hearts, open up their eyes to see the truth, and then they would come to you. And I pray that for those who are here as believers, who may be up to this point in their lives, they may be a believer, but they're not living the way that you would have them live. They're, they're trying to, to be successful in the world's eyes and they might be missing out on being successful in yours. And I pray that you would work in, in all of our hearts and help us to live for you. And that as a result of it, Lord, many, many people, just like in Adoniram Judson's life, would come to know you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.